brokers here at Quiet Light, the less I feel like I've achieved anything in my life. I think you and I are just a couple of slackers compared to the people that have joined the company. You know, I, I feel the exact same way. Uh, we were at uh, capitalism.com just a few weeks ago, and uh, I was standing next to Walker, uh, who, you know, the last picture he sent me was of him in a lineup with Bill Nye, the science guy, you know, right next to him. And, you know, he's casually mentioning over uh, dinner about uh, the different documentaries he's been a part of um, and, and all of that, right? But uh, it goes for every single person on the team. Um, Amanda, when we were talking to her there, Ken, I was just consistently feeling like, Boy, I need to get my button gear. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't try to have in-depth conversations with Amanda about business because I just feel stupid. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, she just, she just starts going off, and you're like, oh, okay. I, I, everything I thought I knew, yeah, I, it pales in comparison. Brad, though, is one of those guys, and I remember the first time we did a company-wide call. We do this once in a while at Quiet Light Brokerage because we're all over the, the, the world, all over the country, but all over the world. And so, I don't know, maybe once a quarter we have a company-wide Zoom conference call where we can see everybody. And there was Brad on top, in his office, overlooking his factory floor. <laughs> and I think everyone was just kind of like, oh, oh, well, this guy's actually done and accomplished some real things. Yeah, yeah. Jason was calling from uh, his kitchen. Uh, Amanda was calling from a car. Uh, Chuck was from home. I was from home. You, of course, have to get out of your house because you've got a basketball team and a half in your house. Well, maybe not that much. I exaggerate. I'd love to exaggerate about the number of kids you have, by the way. It, it changed since the last time, by the way. We've added like four more kids. So uh, it's attracted okay. to, you know. It's a completely different podcast right there. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah uh, Brad so, was somewhere in the world. We, had no, we have no idea. I think he was in uh, Cuba or Costa Rica or something. Oh, I don't remember. Ryan, he's always somewhere else, some yeah. other, you know, exotic location. Uh, but yeah, Brad. Brad's an impressive guy. Uh, very low key, but man, he's sharp. Um, he talks about his history. Talks about what he did at the uh, Blue Cotton T-shirt company. Um, takes twenty-two hands to make one T-shirt. It gets touched twenty-two times. But he stepped in, uh, focused on SEO, and uh, that company blew up after a couple of years of him being there. But that's not really what the podcast is about. It's about him and his experience, but I really focused in on his content portfolio. Uh, at one point, while running or while being a partner at Blue Cotton, he built a small little multi-million dollar content portfolio on the side and eventually sold it. And uh, he outsourced everything. He had a reasonably uh, low workload. Um, and he used initially other people's money. Uh, you'll have to listen to find out whose money he used. It's kind of interesting and fun, but uh, he did very well. He talks about that approach, and I think it's something that any listener can get to uh, get so get something out of it in terms of whether they're building their own portfolio of physical products companies, dropship companies, SaaS companies, or content uh, companies. And of course, get to know Brad along the way as well, which is kind of the purpose of the podcast. But I think there's so much more to it than just getting to know Brad Wayland. Yeah, I think one of the things I love about this company is it seems like everybody that we bring on just seems to up the ante as far as their qualifications, right? I mean, two or, two or three years from now, we're going to have Elon Musk asking us for a job. Um, okay, that'd be very sad for <laughs> All the, the investors of Tesla, sorry. Oh. I don't know, maybe they'll kick him out by then, uh, who knows. All right, uh, enough of me talking, enough of you talking. Let's, let's listen to Brad. Hey folks, it's Joe at Quiet Light Brokerage, and today we have one of our very own on the podcast with us. Now, don't get bored. He actually has a lifetime of entrepreneurial experience. He's bought and sold many businesses. He's kind of a big deal. Uh, I think he bought and sold more than I have for sure, probably more than uh, most of us. His name is Brad. Most of you folks listening know who he is. Brad Whalen, welcome to the Quiet Light Podcast. Hey, Joe. How you Thanks doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well. Are you ready to tell all of these people everything about you? I'm ready to tell them, but uh, I, I would uh, 
contest your point that I'm kind of a big deal. In fact, I was on another podcast with Chris Guthrie, who you had uh, on the Quiet Light podcast a couple months ago. And several years ago, he did an intro and he said, most of you probably don't know Brad Wayland. He's what I call a silent baller. <laughs> I was like, all right, well. He subscribes uh, so, to HBO. So, yeah, I would, I, would, uh, I would call myself pretty well unknown, uh, but I have had a lot of experience and hope that I can share some things today that will help our listeners. Well, you are humble. There, there is that, and you're, you're part of the Quiet Light team because of that vast amount of experience that you do have. And you're, you're one of the few, actually maybe the only one where Mark actually said, hey, maybe you should do this versus the rest of us, which you know, reached out to Mark and said, hey, can we do this? That's right, isn't it? Mark asked you to join the team. Well, there's different versions of that story, but uh, <laughs> I specifically remember that I asked Mark, um, you know, I, I knew Chuck from the buying and selling world. So I kind of made a joke at Mark about, oh, hey, we brought Chuck on. I guess, you know, I guess if things don't go well in the buying and selling world, you might end up doing some brokering. And he was like, mm, I think you might be interested in doing some brokering at Quiet Light. And that's where the conversation kind of started. And then over about a six month period, he kind of uh, showed me the Quiet Light way and I started getting more and more interested and I, I've really enjoyed my time at Quiet Light so far. It's a group of people and um, really every day when we get on the phone calls with buyers and sellers, I'm just blown away by how impressed they are with the team we have at Quiet Light. Just the knowledge that's there. It's, it's entrepreneurs. I tell everybody every day, it's entrepreneur led. These are people that have bought, sold, built, operated been through hard times. Um, so I really do enjoy it. And uh, I think brokers sometimes have like a, a little bit of a stigma attached to them. And I think that we are kind of uh, definitely leading the way and kind of changing that because uh, I find that people really look at Quiet Light as a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I was just at Brand Builders Summit down in Austin. And um, really for the first time in a long time. I mean, I started in 2012 and it, the broker stigma had um, an icky feel to it. You and I have been self-employed for years, decades probably. Um, and, uh, and people are starting to reach out to brokers for the experience and expertise that we do have. So it's good. But let's talk about your experience and expertise. Um, who the heck are you? Um, tell us about your entrepreneurial history and uh, when you started and kind of yeah. how many things you bought, sold, so on and so forth. Yeah, so I, uh, I started uh, having some interest in the internet world around 2003, and uh, I had graduated from college with a finance degree and was working as an accountant uh, for a publicly traded company, and uh, really hated the work and, and actually thought, you know what, I'm going to get fired from this job before I can find another job because I felt like I was doing such a poor job. I just wasn't really built for the check into your cubicle at 8 a.m. and check out at 5 p.m. I needed something a little more um, challenging for me and maybe a little less structured. And so I um, was thinking I would go into financial planning because I had a degree in it and had an offer. And a couple of friends of mine said, hey, would you like to uh, come on and work on some business development for us in our t-shirt company? And they had just crossed a million in sales and they had launched a website. It's called Blue Cotton. And so I came on and quickly I became enamored with search engine optimization and spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And honestly, I fumbled it around like four years and even to the point where I think they thought, does this guy have any idea what he's doing at all? Um, but around 2005, I started realizing what we needed to do and that was rebuild the site. It had not been built where it could really ever rank the way that certain things were structured and uh, basically, the site was just a giant image. So we rebuilt it, took two years to rebuild it. And when we launched it, we were on the front page of Gizmodo uh, within 24 hours from just people finding it. And uh, back Gizmodo. then, there wasn't Gizmodo. What the heck is Gizmodo? So it's just a popular tech blog. I'm sure you probably heard of it. But um, clearly, I haven't. So it, it crashed. <laughs> well, it crashed the site. And so. Um, you know, that first day we launched it and I was sitting there thinking, boy, we spent two years working on this project. It's never going to do anything. And that morning we got a phone call from the developers. Our phones were ringing off the hook and they said, something's going on. There's tons of traffic on the site. Back then you didn't even have Google Analytics. We were paying for index tools back then. 
And so uh, they, you know, Gizmodo crashed the site. We had something like, you know, 5 million people trying to get to the site and couldn't happen. You know, it was just some crazy, you know, situation and there was no social media. So a lot of the traffic back then went through these popular blogs. That's how people, they had their RSS readers on their desktop and they would go through and read their articles and stuff. So they did that. And then we had built the design studio where people would create their t-shirts in flash. And a month later, Adobe awarded us the site of the day, which didn't crash the site, but it gave us a page rank nine of 10 link from Adobe's website, which wow. Adobe was the most, at the time, Adobe was the most linked to website in the world. And the, the combination of Gizmodo, well, because of uh, Acrobat and I mean, all, think of all the click here's that you have for Flash, for PDF Reader, for all those things. They had tons of links coming in. And so the combination of those two things propelled us and we went on a crazy tear of growth and grew at 50% a year for nine years on average. Whoa. And we'll, let, from, we'll, we'll let the listeners uh, do the math on that. Unless you can tell us 50% a year for nine years. You're gonna be <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we went, we, we grew from, you know, I mean, we were small, we were like, you know, a million dollars in sales, but that, that ride took us from like uh, 12 took us to about 7 million and, um, and, uh, you know, I still own my, uh, equity in that company, uh, didn't start that way. Uh, we kind of, after, after the web kind of took over, uh, the two owners came to me and said, Hey, 85% of our revenue is coming through this thing you've helped us work on. So we need to come up with a, an arrangement here. So, um, ended up doing that in 2008. And, uh, you know, today blue cotton is still a, a thriving business. It's got, uh, you know, we're, I would call us a uh, medium sized business now. Um, you know, we're, uh, we'll be considered a, a low eight figure uh, business in terms of revenue. We've got 125 employees, 110,000 square feet of production um, capabilities, um, which we're not using all of that now. We use about 55,000 of the production. So I did that. And, you know, just to kind of quickly, summarize that when you're in the custom t-shirt world, you are making money in the most difficult way possible. A custom t-shirt has to be touched by about 20 people before it goes out the door. And if you order one for your family reunion, then it's got Joe's Joe Valley's family reunion, 2018. It's time sensitive. You've got a specific idea and you don't want to be the guy that ordered them and your family says, man, Joe, these are awful. You did a terrible job designing them. So there's a lot of anxiety in the purchase. And so I became pretty interested in content. And around 2010, a friend of mine uh, who was a, is a pretty big name in the vector space, like image vectors, um, he was looking at a blog for sale and it was on Flippa. And he, it, was, it was a $50,000 purchase price. And he said, you know what? It's only worth 25 grand to me. And I thought, man, that thing has content and ads. Like that's the most amazing business model I've ever seen. You don't have to do anything. Well, especially, so that was, compared, especially compared to 22 <laughs> hands per t-shirt. <laughs> right. So, so when, so I ended up buying that site for $50,000 and that started a new uh, trajectory for me from 2010. I started getting heavily involved into content and affiliate and just bought and sold a lot of stuff in 2010 and 2015. 2015, I divested a lot of it out to private equity, but, um, but the... Can you ballpark how many you bought and sold in that, in that time period? Yeah, so I did 30 transactions between wow. 2010 and, and 2016, and um, most of it was buying. I had, I had basically four sales. Everything else was purchased. So, so uh, you know... I'll kind of quickly, the, the space was the design web design space. So the blog that I bought, the economy was kind of in the tank in 2010. And so the blog that I bought, I quickly made my money back on it. It was a $50,000 purchase and I made the money back in like 10 months. And I thought, this is, this is like too good to be true. Yeah. Um, so I started kind of keeping my eyes open for opportunities and found another one that was for sale and overpaid for it compared you know, to what I had done. So I paid 72,000 for the second one and it started on that same trajectory. But after those first two, the economy was really not doing well. And I started having people reach out to me. And so I had a guy reach out and say, Hey, I hear you're the guy that buys 
web design sites. You've bought this one and this one. Mm -hmm. Would you want to buy mine? Well, I was tapped out on cash. I had spent all my, you know, kind of extra money uh, that I had to kind of do something like that with. And so uh, I told him, um, you know what, I'll do, uh, I'll give you about 80% of what you've made in the last year, but that's the best I can do. And I, and I could do it today. And they said, and he said, and he said I'll take it. So let, let's talk about that on, on just for a moment, because you've got experience. I mean, you bought 30 businesses, 30 transactions over the last several years. Was your process uh, New York, Wall Street, balls to the wall, tough <laughs> negotiating? Or was it oh, nice no. guy, they really liked you, and you built a relationship and made it work for both of you? I'm probably neither. Uh, I'm a quick decision maker. When I, was in, when I graduated from college, I had the opportunity to meet Warren Buffett at a finance um, event that went on in my hometown here of Bowling Green. And Warren Buffett said that he plays bridge and he drinks Diet Coke and he takes 13 phone calls a day and he doesn't have a computer in his office. And one of the questions was, how do you evaluate companies? He had bought Fruit of the Loom, which is why he was in town. And they said, how do you evaluate? And he said, honestly, I don't spend a lot of time on it. I go with my gut. I look at you know the few things that I think I have, but I usually make a decision within a matter of hours about whether or not I want to buy something, the price, everything which is not the way m a is done. Wow. You know, he's, he's a great capitalist in terms of what he does. And that's not me. So, so I'm, I'm not trying to compare myself to Warren Buffett, but there's one element that is like me, and that is I don't waste time. I'm, I like to put deals together. I'm not very patient. And that kind of benefited me in the buying and selling world. So, you know, I just, I did things very unconventional. Um, like my transactions, I would never use escrow. I would, I would try to do it as fast as possible meet them in person, come up with an arrangement of I'm going to wire half, you know, here, and then you're going to transfer this, or I'm going to wire it all. And you're going to transfer these things at the same time. Um, you know, I just did a lot of things that weren't kind of the norms because I'm just not very patient. Like I wanted to get my hands on it that second. I didn't want to wait 60 days for things to pan out. So no long drawn out contract negotiations on asset purchase agreements or SBA deals, anything like no. that. Pretty simple. Oh, no. and, um, you know, I would say that I focused less on making sure I got this exact price that I wanted at the exact multiple that I wanted. And I focused more on trying to find things that I knew I could immediately do something with. When I got into the design space, I don't know anything about design. You know, at Blue Cotton, we have nine designers that, that work there. I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about web design, really. I know I can tell you some names of like what posts would be like, but I, I know nothing. If you put me in one, inside of one of those um, you know, Adobe programs, I'm totally lost. I know, I know nothing about it. Um, but what I did learn pretty quickly is that there's some economies of scale to having things that are like each other. And so, you know, when I had one blog and an advertiser would come through, it was like, well, what would happen if I had five of these blogs? Well, what I could do is I could leverage the advertiser for five times the amount and have the same amount of contact. And so I did a lot of that. And I did that on the affiliate side. You know, I could negotiate better affiliate deals for my company because I would say, well, here's all the traffic I have in total. And they would look at it and be like, oh, well, if you've got that much, then we want to do this size email send or we want to do this size ad buy. And so I started to feel that, you know, and, and a lot of the, so about 15 of my 26 purchases were in the design space. And did you have writers that were consistently focused on the design space, outsource VAs, or did you do yeah. it all yourself? Yeah. So in the design space, there's a lot of writers available. Uh, if you go to some of the popular sites like Smashing Mag or some of these other big names, you'll see a new name every day. And so um, I, again, I, I kind of always tried to structure things in a way where I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time on them. So, you know, one of the things that I did is, I found writers that were okay with being paid once a month because I didn't want to be jumping into PayPal 15 times a month to pay writers. So I found writers that could go across several sites that wanted to do like a substantial amount of work. And so I'd have four or five of them. And then at the end of the month, I would just one time pay everybody for all their posts. Um, I found people that knew what I wanted instead of me we're having to review every single post. I found people that I was like, okay, you did these three posts for me and this is exactly what I want. 
go down that road. Some of them would send me like a, here's what I'm thinking about doing this month. Some of them were just like, I know what he wants and they would just do it. And I just always tried to streamline things to a, the most hands off as possible. I did not want to hire people to support the network. I didn't want, I wanted to keep it very like the opposite of the t-shirt business. I wanted it to be something that I could do a lot with a little time. Did you put all 30 of the properties or 26 when you sold four off? Did you put them all in one LLC? Did you have them separate? How'd that work out? Well, I had two, we haven't gotten into how I built the portfolio. So I will tell you that I quickly ran out of my own cash and had to start looking for help. So I did end up having um, three different LLCs total. And that was because of the way I had to go find capital, you know, for the deals. Okay. And so, um, you know, and then, and then I kind of got tired of that. And so I basically rolled all of those partners up in a loan and got them out and took everything over a hundred percent. And, you know, the thing is when you're, there's guys that listen to our podcast that are out there raising money. And I had a conversation with one of our, someone who's buying a property from us yesterday about it. You know, when you're trying to raise money from people, um, instead of going out and asking for everything you think they can get, possibly muster up, one of the best ways to convince people that you could give them good returns on their money is to do something good with some, with a small amount of money, something that you know is not a big deal to them. And I didn't really do that on purpose. It's just that my deals started out kind of small. Uh, you know, I started around this $50,000 range. And by the time I was done, I wasn't interested in $50,000 transactions. I didn't do anything that was all that large, but I did, I did a couple of 300s. I did two $500,000 transactions. And the thing about those transactions is I put that money together in days. It wasn't, and it wasn't coming out of my bank account. So I had people that believed in what I was doing and I could literally pick up the phone and say, Hey, I've got this opportunity. And they would say, I'm in. For those that are listening that have a portfolio of folks that might do that, but for those folks that are investing that haven't, you know, ever done it before, are they getting equity? Are they getting a return on investment? And how quickly do you start paying them back? Yeah. So the way that I always kind of pitched it, I didn't have anybody that I was connected to that was like used to investing in technology. You know, so I'm talking about people that, you know, have, have some extra income or extra savings um, but they're not people that were like highly technical. So, uh, my parents, you know, the first people I went to were my parents and said, Hey, would you guys want to invest, you know, a little bit of your money into an idea? And they said, sure. What's the terms? Well, my terms were terrible for me. In my opinion, I said, well, if you'll put up the money, I'll give you 50%. That's where I started. Wow. And I talked to someone yesterday who said that that was absolutely ridiculous. They were like, you gave them 50%. I was like, well, I didn't have, I wasn't going to be able to buy it. They myself. did raise you. So that, you know, they, they, <laughs> they ultimately lost money on the whole transaction <laughs> called Brad Whaley, but still. That's true. There's some things, there's some things in our past. Uh, there's some car situations and things like that, that definitely cost them some money and heartache. But um, I started with them. And, but, but I became concerned also about, well, wait a second, they're willing to put a lot into this after, after we started going, they're willing to put more into this. And I started thinking, I don't really want to be responsible for my own livelihood and know that I could potentially tank theirs. Right. So I started to get kind of concerned about that and, you know, they didn't have unlimited funds anyway. Um, but you know, around that time I started looking to partner with other folks and I partnered with some people that I didn't know as well as my parents. So people that had told me like, Hey, I want to get in. And my, my relative over here is willing to invest in me. So I did that kind of deal and I became pretty uncomfortable with those pretty quick. And, and the reason why is because you know, when you're working with your parents or if you're working with a close friend, you kind of know we're not going to end up in a courtroom somewhere. Right you know that that's not going to happen. You know, now you could ruin your relationship or you could have that little, you know, mark on your relationship where you're like, well, remember that time when I lost like $400,000 of your money? Sorry about that. You know, like that's not a good situation, but I started getting uncomfortable with having partners at all in the space when I took on partners I didn't know. So how did you determine, you know, once you, once you got beyond that experimental stage and, you know, your relatives and friends of relatives and giving them too much, what would you recommend to somebody that's listening that wants to build a portfolio of sites is getting money from people are not used to investing, 
what would you say? Look, if I were to do it all over again with what I know, I'd probably offer them X, Y, Z and pay them how often? Can you summarize what you yeah. do? So, so if I could do it all over again, I probably would do it the same way. I, I, I understand that giving up 50% sounds like, you know, I don't know if that sounds like a lot or not. One guy I talked to yesterday said, man, that sounds like a lot. Um, it probably was a lot. They weren't doing anything. And, and I was, you asked a minute ago, were they getting paid? If I took a check, they got a check. And I was looking for cash flow because I wanted to build up and be able to go buy more and do things. So, so I wanted to realize real gains and mm. kind of do something with them. So, um, so, so in terms of doing it, I would give a lot early, but I would structure the agreements to where you control the situation. And that is one thing I did. I just, when you have all the knowledge and the other side doesn't really have an opinion, they're like, Hey, I don't really know what you're doing with the money over there. I just know that you're operating these websites out here and you're making us some money. When you have that kind of arrangement, those people are more willing to say, well, you tell us what the investment's going to look like. And so, you know, from my perspective, I kind of went down the road of just saying, look, I want to, I still want to pay you your money, but I don't want to have partners anymore for various reasons. Like I want to structure this in such a way that make sure that you get your return, but also make sure that I benefit um, from it in the way that I think I should long term. And so I'd like to roll out. Basically, I bought them out. I just came up with a structure and said, this is how I would value the properties. And I can use cash flow from the properties to pay this off. And so I rolled everything out into basically a seller finance note. And I was able to get it done in, you know, 20, 30 days. I mean, I, as opposed to an SBA loan or trying to go out and raise, you know, when you, when you do a situation like that where people are giving you their cash and you're dealing with multiple investors, if you are able to call the shots, then when you're ready for that change, you can do it very quickly and efficiently. And How many different investors did you have at that time where you had to, you know, um, get them out? So I only had really, I only had really three people that had invested at that time, but at the same time I was looking to buy more. So when I rolled it out into a loan, I actually brought on three new investors, but I brought them on as just debt. Gotcha. Okay. They were just, and you paid them a higher was, than normal interest rate. I did. Um, so it, it depends on, on who, who it was, but my interest rates were, were six to 9% on the deals that I did. So okay. it just depends on, on who it was. And I never really nickeled and dimed people over the interest rate. I tried to find people that I thought would be people that would trust that I would do the right thing with the money and gotcha. kind of less than trying to get the exact interest rate. Let's talk about, for those listening, thinking about rolling up different properties into a portfolio. Let's talk about um, uh, multiples and, and returns on investment. You know, we talk all the time about a business that's doing a hundred thousand that's five years old with one employee is worth a certain multiple, but it, equal business with one employee and workload that same age that's doing a million in discretionary earnings. Not only is it worth, you know, 10 times more in terms of numbers, but it's also that multiple goes up, right? So instead of two and a half to three and a half times in terms of value, the multiple, because of the size and breadth of the business, that multiple might jump to, you know, four or five times. Um, did you find the same thing to be true when you rolled up essentially 30 small uh, content sites, 30 right. small blogs into one portfolio and sold off to a, a private equity firm? Were they paying a much larger multiple? Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, just, just, you know, the private equity firm that I sold off to, I sold at a four and a half multiple. So just to okay. kind of, that was a high multiple. I, I was very pleased with the transaction. So okay. um, in my sale, I definitely saw an increased multiple. Um, Okay. So from, from my perspective, I did transactions that were, you know, I did a lot of them in the 50,000 range. And then as I got further down the road, I did a lot of 125, 300, a couple of 500s. And here's what I found for, from my perspective, the properties in the, at least in the web design blog space that were selling for more were higher quality properties. So what we deal with every day, like if we're talking to someone who's selling on Amazon, we could find someone that's selling on Amazon that's doing $50,000 a year in discretionary earnings that's got doing everything perfect, but they're in a small category. Whereas you could find someone who's doing a million dollars in discretionary earnings that's doing everything perfect as well, but they're in a broader category. 
Um, so we, we would see that where it's like, hey, they're both doing great, they're, you know, but they just happen to make less. In the design blog space, it wasn't so much like that. It was like, if you're doing great, then you are bigger and you are earning more. And so they did command higher multiples. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, I know one of my 500,000 transactions was a two and a half multiple. And, but I know that one of my $300,000 transactions was a three point, maybe one or two. Multiple. You're talking about when you purchased it. When I purchased, yeah. So, yeah. so, when they, uh, so I when, did a lot of that. When you sold, it was all lumped together and one multiple was applied. They didn't look at the individual blogs and sites and say, we'll give you this for that and this for the other one. It was all. Right. And, and the, and the private equity plays, I mean, I'm sure that you've talked to people just like I have, you know, the private equity world is we're seeing some changes, I think in the industry right now with private equity. I think there's kind of two things going on. One is private equity is scooping up a lot of sites, stripping out all the cost out of them and literally just let them die. And because the return on the money is, is good. Even then um, that's one thing that I've seen private equity doing. And that's what happened with mine. They killed them off. I mean, there's no way. Yeah. But having said that, that company that bought it is thriving. So I think through the acquisition, they learned some things about what they wanted to do and what they were good at. So I don't know that they would look at it as a failure because I think that they were able to use the information to then go and build a much bigger company that's doing some pretty big things. On the other hand, uh, I had mentioned the um, other way that private equity is going, like we just had a transaction that closed this week that, that I week, where you've got an operational group that is under private equity. So we see the private equity guys a lot of times they're like, Hey, we want 5 million in EBITDA. Well, we don't have a lot of sites that come our way that have got these big seller discretionary numbers. So what I think is happening in the industry right now is there are these operational groups that are saying, Hey, we'll go deal with, 10 or 15 of these things, we'll still get you your, whatever you're looking for, several million dollars in seller discretionary earnings, but we'll operate all these things underneath you and kind of keep them running. And, and I do think that the, the like, hold on to the content and just let it die. I think that Google especially is fighting against that right now specifically. I think their freshness algorithm has kind of taken over and kind of prevented people from being able to do that effectively. And so I don't think that strategy is advised or a good idea and i think it will go away completely I, I meaning the algorithm updates are having those sites die off a lot faster if you're not doing anything to they do them. they they just they track what you're doing and i've even done some <clears throat> experiments uh so i own, i still own a small content portfolio and i have a marketing firm that runs runs those for me they basically do all the content and everything and we have experimented and seen google freshness is a very real algorithm um, that if you fall asleep on a blog or something that has any kind of time sensitivity at all, then you will pay the price and it doesn't take very long. Gotcha. So for anybody listening that thinks that quiet light is only a physical products, e-commerce brokerage firm, Brad is obviously showing us that the experience that we have is pretty vast. You know, Jason's been in the affiliates space. Uh, we've all done SaaS affiliate content advertising, uh, physical products, uh, Brad, obviously, I think probably the bulk of transactions that you've closed so far with quiet light as an advisor here have been in the physical product space, uh, but you've got a tremendous yeah. amount of experience in, in uh, content as well. Correct. Yeah. To me, the content is hard to come by. I don't know if you feel that way or not, but I don't, I don't get them a lot. Uh, I did a transaction last month uh, for a guy that I actually had bought three websites from in my buying days and mm -hmm. it was a really interesting dynamic because I was able to when the when the buyers get on the phone and saying can I trust this guy I was able to say you know what I did three deals with him myself and I can tell you when exactly like this this and this so that was kind of a neat thing but you know he came to me and said hey I want to sell a content site and he was monetizing it through digital downloads and not a big not a big transaction couple hundred thousand dollar transaction and uh you know, he said, what should I expect? And I said, you know what? I, the content's pretty hot. We don't get tons and tons of content people trying to sell these days. It's people want to hold on to it because it's very low workload and it's very high earnings for what people are doing. And, and they, they seem to be getting very good multiples for it. So we priced it out at, uh, we priced it out at a 3.25 multiple and we got about 96% or something of the ask within 
72 hours. I think you sent me an email and said, both your listings this week are going to be under LOI by the end of the weekend. You were right. One was 48 hours. One was 72 hours. That transaction was closed in three weeks, start to finish. Yeah. Content's easier to do uh, due diligence on as well. I just had a content site close. What is, we're recording on, I think a uh, Wednesday, right? So yeah. um, 10 days ago, less than 10 days ago, I had uh, one sell and it's interesting. I'll give you the details of it. Daily updates, hundreds of thousands of vid- visitors to it. And Google was rewarding it like crazy because of the vast amount of new content on a daily basis. Uh, and the, the revenue took off like, like a rocket. Uh, it was just under a $9 million transaction and a very, very high multiple higher than yours, but it was explosive growth. It was very big. A lot of, uh, that discretionary earnings obviously very high. So the bigger, the discretionary earnings, quicker the growth that you've got there, the higher the multiple as well. Um, so at content sites, if you're out there listening and you've got a portfolio of them or you're an in- individual uh, person running one and you think that you're hearing things that they're not worth all that much, um, truth of the matter is that we've, we sold lots and there's lots of good buyers for them. No, and, and I think that, I think that to your point, you asked the question earlier, are we seeing the multiples go up, you know, the same way? And yeah, you know, I think across the board, you just have a supply and demand issue when you get into larger sites. There's just not a lot of them available. And we're seeing that our buyers are ready to go on larger transactions. You know, you just don't get as many large transactions to come by. In the example that you gave, I'm pretty sure you had competing offers on that deal. I did. I had, uh, and I had three offers. Three offers yeah. and they kept, uh, they, they outbid each other and drove it up. Uh, three Brian. offers on a $9 million property. That's, that's yeah. a big. And Brian's got the physical products business. It's nutritional supplements. It was listed at $15 million. Right. And is under contract at at higher than that, yep. uh, and because there were multiple offers on it, so um, don't be afraid. I hear people tell me, "Look, I think I should sell before it gets too big because there's not going to be any as many buyers out there." That's that's not what I'm finding. It's not the case. Wouldn't you agree that there's a ton of money out yeah. there for the right business? If it's a good quality business, it's going to last. Well, it, it, it'll sound very counterproductive to what we're trying to do at Quiet Light, but every week I talk to people on the phone and I just basically tell them, if you've got the willingness to keep working on your business, you should not sell. I mean, you just, you just shouldn't because you should grow it as big as you can because it's not, it's not easy to build a business that does what your business is doing, whatever it is. Anyone that we're talking to is having some level of success uh, because they're talking about selling and they know they've got cash flow and things like that. And, um, you know, I just always tell them if you're done, let's go. If you're ready to be done or you got other plans or you want to travel, or you want to do this or that, or you want to, you got a new venture that you're thinking about. Sure. Let's list it. Let's get it done. But if you've got the willingness to keep going, then we're here when you're ready, but honestly, keep going, go as far as you can take it. Yeah, Mark calls that reckless honesty because it's not necessarily in our best interest, but it's what we all do. He did it for me when I sold back in 2010. Um, The difference, I'll tell you now, for those that are thinking they're emotionally tired and done, really, you've got to sort of tap yourself in the chest and say, do I have the heart? Because the the, the worst conversations I've had are when um, I say, look, you know, you want X value, your business realistically is only worth Y. If you hang on another 12 months and you reinvest your energies, you set some goals, you get that traffic back up and you get that revenue going again at a higher level, you'll get why, but it's going to take 12 months. The worst conversations I have are when they come back to me in 12 months and say, you know, I didn't do any of it. Uh, the revenue's, you know, gone down 20%. Can I, yeah. can I still get the X you talked about? And the answer is no, uh, because <laughs> they didn't have the heart. <laughs> Those yeah. are the worst conversations. So right. always I tell people tap in my chest, if you got the heart, do it. But like you say, if you're emotionally done, if you're, if you're ready, um, we're yeah. ready. I think some people, I've been doing this six years, as you know, and occasionally we tell people, look, it's in your best interest to hold off. Sometimes they'll interpret that as we don't want to list their business. That's not the case at all. When yeah, they're no. ready, we'll do it. We'll get that buyer. And just from the few examples that we've talked about, there are buyers in, in situations where we get it under contract very, very quickly. Well, listen, Brett, we are running short on time. Um, uh, you've shared a lot of information here that I think will give people a good insight into you into building a, uh, a portfolio of 
either content businesses or any businesses, the way that they can sort of piece it together the way you did and then exiting, which is fantastic. Um, I do want to talk about one thing briefly though, um, personal in nature, if you don't mind, can we, can we, I won't go too far, I promise, but say yes. Yes. Okay. So I understand you went hiking in North wow. Carolina. <laughs> In, in North Carolina recently, and uh, they're renaming a mountain uh, after you. Yeah. Can you. What happened there? Well, uh, my wife and I have five boys, uh, aging from range 2 to 11. So we're pretty busy living life. And uh, for our 16th anniversary, we decided to go to Asheville, North Carolina, leave the kids at home. My parents came to town to take care of them. And we went to Catawba Falls. Uh, which you can Google it. There's been many fatal accidents there. In fact, there's been a fatal accident there since I left. Um, the Pisgah National Forest has many accidents from what I've come to learn, but we were hiking up a trail at Catawba Falls, and then we entered a closed section of the trail that I didn't know. It's a ropes uh, kind of situation, so we're climbing up ropes and going up a, a rocky kind of cliff. Let me just clarify yeah. for the attorneys out there that are thinking they can help you. You <laughs> entered a closed section of the trail. Closed. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Here's the thing. I've got some lawyer friends that have reached out to me about it. And here's the other thing. The Pisgah National Forest is owned by the U.S. government. So if you decide that you want to sue them, just know that the U.S. government does not take um, lawsuits kindly and they take zero liability. So I had friends reach out to me and say, you need to pursue this. And then I was like, well, it's in the Pisgah National Forest. And they're like, no, that's not going to work. You're going to lose that. But, um, you know, basically it depends on the state. North Carolina does not have very friendly laws for stuff like that anyway. It's one of the least friendly states for that. But uh, hiked up, saw a beautiful waterfall. Actually, in a, it was filmed in the movie The Hunger Games. Uh, and that's why we wanted to go up and see it. So we went up there, saw the waterfall. We needed to kind of get a move on it because we had hiked a lot longer than we had expected. So we were moving very quickly on the way down. You, you, and, you and your, your wife and kids or just you and your wife? No, just me and my wife. The kids were at home. Thankfully. And I vacated the ropes for a minute. I, I saw a path. It seemed like a reasonable thing to do. It was only going to be like 10 feet. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't remember anything after that. I fell 40 feet. Um, down a very rocky slope and I don't remember anything until the paramedics and the firemen were there. They tried to life light me out. They couldn't do it. And I broke my arm, dislocated my shoulder, collapsed my lung, um, had deep bruises and, and things like that. Did not have a concussion, surprisingly. You got to three and a half hours to get, to get yeah, no, <laughs> it took them three and a half hours to get me out wow. into the hospital. And, uh, Anyway, thank God it was just uh, just a lucky situation. Very scary for my wife. Uh, yeah, she was okay. talking to me for a long time without me really knowing what was going on. For 45 minutes, she thought he's lost his mind. But Well, the first thing I think we all did at Quiet Light was, you know, said, <laughs> thankfully, you're okay. And we were, you know, doing little prayers for you and all that stuff. And then we said, man, that guy's just not so bright. He's going on the clothes trails. Uh, for everybody listening, if anybody is foolish enough to do it, Brad, we bought him the inflatable, what are they called? The inflatable? I, they're like those big bubbles, you know, that you get inside with your family. We bought and Brad a bunch of those. And, and uh, I started a petition here in North Carolina to change Catawba <laughs> Falls to Wayland Falls, but nobody yeah. listened. Nobody yeah, listened no. at all. Unfortunately. I've been, I've been there. I've been there. And next time I go again, I'm not going on the closed trails, I don't think. But you may time. not know where the closed trails are. I didn't know it was closed. <laughs> okay. I've been there because <laughs> I know that it was like, oh, look, that's where the Hunger Games was filmed. Yeah. I'm going to bring a sign and I'm going to drop it in there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a sledgehammer and put it in the ground and call it Catawba Falls and take a picture for you. Yeah. See if anybody takes it out. It could be there for it was It was a crazy accident, and I, I'm, I'm thankful for all the support I got from Quiet Life, from friends and family. It was, uh, I recovered very quickly. I've got, a, I've got a pretty gnarly scar right here that is still, I'm hoping it's going to turn the color of my skin because it looks like I got, you know, really depressed or something. But he's, he's holding up his wrist, ladies and gentlemen, and it looks like he, he decided to um, take his own try. Yeah. Take it. No, no, that's what it looks like. Is there a pin in there now? 
Yeah, there's a plate and about a dozen screws in that arm, but I've, I've got full mobility back. I'm through therapy. Um, can't do push-ups yet, but I'm getting closer. Good. And you did it all while we started a quiet line and you had listings and not a single client really knew what was going on. And they, it's because you, you worked anyway, which was amazing. So that's awesome. Well, I, again, Catawba Falls is going to try to get it changed to Wayland Falls, but uh, we'll see if that happens or not. Good luck with that. Brad, thank you. I learned a lot. I learned Thanks, a lot Jay. about you and I appreciate your time. Hopefully everybody here has did as well. And um, we'll uh, keep doing what we do here at Twilight. Thanks, man. Okay. Thanks a lot for having me on. Oh, 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 oh,